All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome along to this special edition Dovetail webinar uh, on today's topic, Vaping and E-Cigarettes, the New World of Electronic Drug Delivery Systems. Thank you for coming along. Um, this presentation we put together due to a fairly sudden-ish increase in calls for support around the topic of vaping. Um, I think since the beginning of this year, we've had uh, Dovetail, we've noticed a, a noticeable increase in people finding us for support around this topic, particularly in relation to schools. So we thought we'll put together a webinar uh, covering all of this new universe of vaping and e-cigarettes and um, give people a bit of an overview of this actually fairly complex topic, uh, along with some suggestions of how we can respond to this area. So before I go much further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today and pay respects to the elders past and present. So this um, topic, as I mentioned, we've received an increase in calls for support regarding the topic of vaping uh, this year in particular, although it has been coming for several years. And I think what we've been noticing on the phone when we're talking to people about this topic is it's a bit confusing and a little bit hard to explain uh, the whole sort of range of issues relating to this topic. So in this presentation, this is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to start by giving an overview of the different types of, of devices which are out there uh, and explain the sort of the world of these different sorts of products. We'll talk a bit about what's inside the devices, so what's inside the actual machines themselves, but also some of the products people are, are, are vaping inside the devices. We'll do an overview of the health risks versus benefits. And this is a bit of a contentious topic around, you know, are these devices able to reduce harm for some people? Uh, and are there unknown harms that we need to consider? That sort of thing, which we'll cover. Uh, I'll give an overview of the Queensland legal situation. Uh, apologies for viewers from outside of Queensland, but uh, yeah, we've a Queensland focused service, so we're going to talk a bit about what the Queensland laws say, um, also the federal laws via the Therapeutic Goods Administration and, and what that sort of means for people accessing these types of devices. And I'll finish the presentation with uh, a bit of an overview of how should we be responding to young people who might actually be vaping. Okay, so to start off with the history of these devices, they've actually been around for a really long time. There's been different types of, of, of vaping-like devices have existed since at least the 1920s. Uh, uh, in 1963, there was a smokeless non-tobacco cigarette patented uh, in the United States, which sounds very, very much like what we know today as an e-cigarette. Uh, the image on your screen there is from the, one of the first modern e-cigarette devices which was invented by a Chinese pharmacist uh, back in 2003. So this Chinese pharmacist who invented this particular device, his uh, father was a really heavy tobacco smoker and actually passed away from smoking related disease and that sort of prompted uh, his son to try and come up with a, a device that might be a little bit safer than combusted tobacco. So that's where the modern e-cigarette as we know it today first emerged. Now we we'll put together this bit of a family tree to try and help explain the range of devices which are available out there. Uh, there is a whole bunch of them as you can see and what we've done is that we can broadly define these devices into two major types. We've got the, the most common one that everyone's sort of familiar with, I think, are the e-liquid devices or the e-cigarette or vapor, vapor um, device, which takes the sort of vapor juice, a, a liquid made up of propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin. Uh, these are the uh, commonly known as the sort of e-cigarettes which, which we see out there. The other major type of these devices are the dry herb vaporizers and these are vaporizers which are designed to uh, heat whole plant material or extracts of, of whole plants. Uh, they heat them just to below combustion to release some of the active ingredients in the dried herbs. So um, we think about those two major families then underneath that we get some subtypes. So amongst the e-liquid devices, the classic e-cigarette, we've got nicotine containing liquids, which obviously contain nicotine. Uh, we also have non-nicotine liquids, which are usually flavoured uh, liquids that are advertised as not containing any nicotine. But we also have psychoactive drugs as well, which can be placed into a propylene glycol glycerin solution. And uh, there are cannabis liquids, but there's also more recently, we've discovered some novel psychoactive substances which are being placed into these propylene glycol vegetable glycerin solutions. And they're things like uh, synthetic cannabinoids, uh, novel benzos, etc. 
the e-liquids, uh, so as we go through the presentation, I'm, I'll be, when I refer to the e-liquids, I'm talking about propylene glycol vegetable glycerin based products. Um, I might just refer to them as PGVG. Uh, it's a little bit easier to get those words out. Um, of the, the dry herb vaporizer types, there's a few different styles of these as well. There, there are dry herb vaporizers which are designed for whole plant cannabis, for regular old fashioned dried cannabis. There are particular devices which have been made for tobacco, to heat tobacco. And lastly, there are uh, particular uh, dry herb vaporizers which are designed to be used with cannabis extracts. And that's things like wax and shatter and oils and those sorts of things, which I'll show you in a sec. So this is a standard e-liquid vaporizing device. And this is what we might call a sort of first generation style device. They're fairly simple. Um, you can see there that's got a little mouthpiece, a heating element which heats up the chamber that stores the propylene glycol vegetable glycerin and nicotine solution. Uh, the little atomizer uh, is what triggers the heating element to heat that liquid up. Uh, a but button in some cases activates the heating element, sometimes they're automated as well. There's often a little battery and a microprocessor to activate uh, the device as well. They're fairly simple. Uh, I should also point out they're really just like a, a smoke machine. Um, if you've ever been to nightclubs and choked on the, uh, the fake smoke at the disco, uh, same stuff, it's exactly the same concept. So this is an image of what we call the first generation e-cigs. E um, these were, as you can see, they look just like cigarettes. That was part of the marketing, was to signal to people that this is a, is a version of a cigarette. They're referred to as having a closed tank, which means that they can't be, um, that they have to use a proprietary liquid capsule. You can't easily just refill them yourself. Um, these are really cheap to produce. They're often uh, disposable. You'd often not even recharge them. It might be thrown out after a week or so. Now, these first generation devices weren't very gr good at delivering large doses of nicotine uh, in the early sort of stages. The particles couldn't get right into the lungs, and so these were not really super efficient at delivering nicotine. So you might know of, if you know people who have attempted to switch to e-cigs to reduce harm from their tobacco smoking, uh, people who tried that on some of these first generation devices found that it wasn't sort of satisfying for them. Uh, the, the later devices have actually changed quite a bit. This is what we'd call second and third generation devices. Um, there's the so-called open tank type, which can be refilled with any liquid. So people can purchase their own liquids and make their own liquids and, and also modify some of these devices as well. Uh, there's a significant uh, YouTube community of people who mod modify their vaporizing devices uh, to do things like um, change the coil, which, which vaporizes the liquids, or to um, increase the amount of vapor that can come out and, and changing the temperatures and things like that. So there is uh, quite a significant subculture of people who are interested in modding these devices. And I think when we get into the, you know, responding to young people who do use vapes, uh, th this is a particular thing to consider because we know there are young people who are approaching this topic like a hobby uh, whereby they you know learn how to modify devices and uh, watch lots of videos on YouTube about how to do that and share their own mods and things like that so there's a bit of a subculture around modding these devices most recently the fourth generation uh, in, this, in this case, we've got an image of a Juul there. So Juul is a brand of vaporizer, very popular in the United States. And it's the term Juul has become so popular now, it's actually a verb. People will talk about Juuling. Um, in some cases in Australia, even using the word when they're not referring to this particular brand of device. Um, Juul became really, really popular in the US, partly through their marketing, but also one of the differences with these Juul devices is that uh, the Juul devices used a salt form of nicotine, which actually uh, absorbs into the system a lot faster than the older sort of vaporizing devices were able to do. So that's giving a really high level of nicotine really rapidly in, in the blood. So these, um, the, the uptake of these Juul devices was probably accelerated because of that as well. Um, now, this is an image of a dry herb vaporizer. This is a German product called the Mighty. Uh, this is, and you can see there, there's a little chamber where the dry herbal material, in this case cannabis, is placed into that little chamber. And it's heated to about 180 degrees. The temperature is adjustable. Uh, 180 or so degrees is, is below combustion, so the cannabis doesn't actually burn. Instead, it, the, the plant releases a whole bunch of the cannabinoids uh, in, into a stream of vapor. Uh, there is some, a little bit of combustion does occur uh, in, in these products, but we do know that it does reduce a lot of the tars that you'd see in usually regularly combusted cannabis. 
Uh, the Mighty, this particular device has been approved in New Zealand and Germany for use as a therapeutic device for administering medical cannabis for people who have a prescription. And there has been actually quite a bit of research done on this particular device, looking at what is the vapor that comes out of it. And it definitely does have a lot less of the tar, not 100% gone, but it definitely has a lot less tar than you might see from combusted cannabis. Uh, this is another type of dry herb vaporizer. This is a PAX. Uh, again, similar concept. There's a little chamber there. Uh, PAX is very stylishly designed. It looks like it's in, uh, made by Apple, uh, which it's not, but it's a very cute little device that is designed to be a dry herb vaporizer predominantly for cannabis. Uh, now, I, I mentioned before too that there are also these sorts of dry, um, dry herb vaporizers designed for co uh, concentrates and extracts of cannabis. And on the screen here is a, a picture of a, of a whole bunch of those different types of extracts that people use. Now, these are not super common in Australia so much. They do appear here. We see th these, these products much more so in countries where there's a legal cannabis market. So particularly in the United States, these solvent-based concentrates like shatter and wax and so forth are very, very common. Uh, having said that, we do see them sometimes in Australia uh, occasionally. Uh, there are particular devices that are designed specifically to vaporise these sorts of extracts. Um, here's a little GIF image which shows you a dab of wax placed directly onto the heating element there. And that heating element will be just like a regular dry herb vaporiser, it will increase the temperature to below combustion and inhale uh, a quite a, a very high, a high dose of THC because it is a concentrated extract. Um, oh, this is also a particular heated tobacco product as well. So based on the same principle as those, the dry herb vaporizer for cannabis, the IQOS, uh, this is a device which is not legally available in Australia, but you can see they look like little miniature cigarettes. So that is actual regular tobacco, uh, which is placed inside the device. And then on the inside of the device is a little heating blade which pierces the, the cigarette uh, and, and heats up that tobacco also below combustion so that it doesn't actually burn. And then that reduces some of the harmful products which might make it through. Um, I'm not 100% sure exactly how much of the harmful products are reduced. It, uh, I would be guessing that there would still be some harmful chemicals making it through uh, a device like this. So the IQOS is invented by Philip Morris uh, as a way of extending the life of their product. So what's in these e-liquids uh, that we see in the common e-cigarette? So I mentioned earlier, they're mostly propylene glycol and or vegetable glycerin in some different combinations, sometimes 50-50, sometimes it's more of one or less of the other. But these are the base of, of pretty much all of those e-liquids. Uh, they're then added with various flavorings or things like nicotine or other chemicals, etc. So this is an image of propylene glycol and glycerin just off, off uh, eBay. You can purchase it very, very cheaply. Uh, one thing I'll mention is that with there are cannabis extracts which are available that are uh, extracted into propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. Um, although that's not very easy to do, the cannabis doesn't easily extract into these sorts of e-liquid products. And so we don't see cannabis containing e-liquids as, as commonly in Australia as somewhere like the United States where with the legal cannabis market, uh, the e-liquid containing cannabis, so propylene glycol glycerin solution with a cannabis extract in it, um, is much more common over there than it is here. And oh, that becomes important because there have been some significant harms associated with those liquids uh, in the United States, which I'll talk about as we go. Um, this is just an image of some of the very pretty uh, sorts of bottles that these things come in. You can see this is much more attractive than the boring bottle on the previous screen. Uh, these are a whole range of, of, glyc of, of PG, VG liquids with various flavorings in them. Uh, most of these are advertised as you, as you, so you might be able to see some of these saying that they do contain nicotine. Most of them do. Um, most countries around the world don't have restrictions on access to nicotine the way Australia does. So um, Australia is a little unique in that we restrict access to nicotine containing liquids here. Um, overseas, uh, there, there really isn't so many nicotine free liquids actually available because there's not much of a market for them. Um, and these are some of the cannabis containing e-liquids. So on the screen here, this is actually, these are CBD containing liquids. So CBD is one of the medicinal components of the, can in the cannabis plant. And we know that in the US, CBD has become very popular for a whole range of different conditions that people are self-medicating with in a number of cases. And these are a whole bunch of different CBD containing liquids here. 
Um, these are often labelled as THC free, uh, so that the, they don't create an intoxicating effect. CBD doesn't isn't really psychoactive. Um, it's not really clear uh, the exact content of some of these products, though. It, it would be likely just from some of the other products out there that some of these do actually contain active ingredients, but we don't exactly know. Um, I'd be predicting that we'll see more and more of these CBD containing liquids in future because they're very popular uh, overseas for uh, often sold, sold generally sold over the counter. Uh, often with some sort of therapeutic claims as well. Uh, now these are THC containing e-liquids. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these have become really popular in the United States. Uh, these are propylene glycol vegetable glycerin solutions that have got an, an extract of TH of cannabis uh, into that liquid. Now we don't see this in Australia very often because it's not very easy to do that extraction. And it sort of only makes sense to do that on a really large scale with large volumes of cannabis to, to manufacture that, to make that sort of economically viable, which is why we don't see it as commonly here. Um, we do occasionally see it, but not as common in the United, as it is in the United States. So we've got this unusual situation in Australia where most, well, all of the liquids being sold over the counter here are being labelled as not containing nicotine. Uh, in, in Australia, it's not legal to purchase nicotine liquids over the counter. At the moment, they can be imported overseas via a TGA special access scheme, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. So that puts Australia in a unique position in that we uh, technically don't have these nicotine containing liquids, but uh, we have flavoured liquids instead advertised as nicotine free. But this particular study, which was uh, undertaken and published in 2019, analysed the contents of 10 different liquids which were purchased online or over the counter from Australian suppliers, and they detected nicotine in six out of the 10 liquids. Uh, and three of those had comparable levels to a regular nicotine e-liquid. So it's not that surprising that that is the case because overseas there really isn't a huge market for nicotine-free liquids. They're basically all nicotine containing. So it's my guess is that these companies have just changed the labelling in order to make these available in Australia despite them uh, you know, being mislabeled in that way. They also discovered some other toxic chemicals in these liquids as well. Um, this, um, the fact that nicotine-free liquids actually turn out to contain nicotine is a big problem for us in Australia because if we're working with young people who might be um, uh, you know, thinking that they're using nicotine free liquids that they're purchasing, some flavoured liquids and things like that, it actually might be the case that they are consuming nicotine without realising that and, and they could be in some cases developing nicotine dependence without um, knowing that that's what's happening. So. In, in some ways, since this study was published, we do have to make a bit of an assumption that uh, many of these liquids do in fact contain nicotine, even when they're advertised that they do not. And it's a bit of a challenge for us working out how, how is it that we best inform young people about the, the fact that this is the case and um, what's our messaging around that. So in terms of the legal status uh, regarding these products in, in Queensland is that they are considered smoking products under Queensland legislation. So that means all of the laws that apply to cigarettes and tobacco apply to these products. So that means you can't um, vape indoors where you're also not allowed to smoke in, in similar sorts of environments, so in restaurants and public places and things like that. Um, it also means you can't sell vaping related products to someone aged under 18. And it also means that you're not to allowed to advertise, promote or display vaping products in a retail outlet. Uh, so obviously tobacco products are now all behind the counter. They're often kept in a cupboard uh, behind the counter and vaping products are uh, under the law are meant to be stored in the same way. Um, I know that that's something I, I've definitely noticed uh, a lot of shops are not exactly complying with that and have got um, some of these products out on display and they may not realise that they, these products are covered by the tobacco uh, legislation in Queensland. Uh, now, with regards to the nicotine, the liquid nicotine is classified as a dangerous poison under the federal poison standard and all, all states sort of follow along with the federal, the federal standard. Um, it's this what this means is it is it's liquid liquid nicotine is illegal to obtain possess manufacture dispense sell advertise use or even destroy 
However, people can import liquid nicotine for human use under the Therapeutic Goods Administration Special Access Scheme, which allows, uh, and the Personal Importation Scheme, which allows people to import uh, a three month supply of nicotine for their own personal use. And there's also what's called the Traveler's Exemption, which is a, obviously someone from overseas who comes to Australia with nicotine liquids, then they are also exempt from this as well. Um, there have been some recent changes to this, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. So at um, the end of last year, the TGA conducted a, a review of the way liquid nicotine was being handled. And this review, there was two reasons for this review to occur. Uh, one of them was that they were concerned about the rapid growth of, of vaping overseas. And they were concerned that vaping of e-liquids containing nicotine could become an on-ramp for non-smokers into smoking. So a pathway into tobacco smoking itself. Uh, the other, uh, other goal of this, this review was to look at how, how to design a simple and legal access scheme for people who want nicotine containing liquids for smoking cessation. So to provide an off-ramp for smokers. So preventing the on-ramp, taking up tobacco smoke and providing an off-ramp, pretty reasonable. Uh, the findings came out in December last year, still quite recent, and the TGA has announced that the decision is that nicotine liquid will become a prescription only uh, substance from October 2021, which means that people will have to go to their GP and get a prescription before they are able to legally import that from overseas. And you can see there's a little graphic there which is displaying the sort of the, the way that that uh, scheme is being proposed to operate. Now, there's a few, like, there's obviously some challenges with this because one, one of the really obvious challenges with this is that we know, and I'll go through some of this research in a sec, we know that the nicotine containing e-liquids are probably a lot less harmful than tobacco smoke, um, which is not very hard because tobacco smoke is very, very toxic, so it's not hard to be safer. But uh, we're setting up a situation where the safer product is harder to access than the really dangerous product, which is on sale in every corner store in the, in the country. And I think that's, that's fairly challenging um, to consider that when we know that the nicotine liquids, uh, that when they're vaped, uh, are less harmful than combusted tobacco smoke. So that, that's one of the challenges that we're confronting on this topic. So let's have a look at the research on a couple of these key questions. Uh, so are e-cigarettes an on-ramp to tobacco smoking? Does it get them hooked? And is this a way that big tobacco companies are gonna keep their product alive? And luckily for us, there's heaps of really good research on this topic. And uh, if we look at research from countries where nicotine containing liquids are widely and easily available, that is the best source for us to have a look at. Because in Australia, this research is a little tricky because technically a lot of the liquids say they're nicotine free, even though we know they're not. So that research is a little bit more tricky for us to conduct. But let's have a look at some countries where nicotine liquid is widely available. So in the United Kingdom, nicotine liquids are widely available everywhere. Um, there's very stylish looking vaping sh vape shops open on all the high streets in the UK. It's very popular. Um, you can see from looking at, this is a, a survey, a, a regular survey that they conduct in the UK on young people's substance use. Um, and you can see here across the different timelines from 2014 when they first started asking these questions up to 2018. And you can see there's actually, so, um, quite a, a big increase in the regular, in people who've ever used these products uh, over time. So it's, you know, about sort of 25-ish percent of the total population have ever used uh, one of these devices you can see a lot a lot less people would describe themselves as a, a current user or a regular user so there's obviously a lot of people here have just experimented but at the same time at which that really high uptake has occurred and in that study it was 2014 is when it sort of started we can see that there has been a continued decline in uh, cigarette smoking amongst young people. So we would expect that if, if there was an on-ramp from nicotine vaping to tobacco smoking, then we should see those, those lines kind of matching up a little bit, uh, because particularly given the growth in e-cigs has been so rapid. Uh, but we haven't actually seen that. We have actually seen that the tobacco smoking has continued that, that decline that it's been on for some time. Uh, similarly, in the United States, so this is the Monitoring the Future study, which is very similar to our uh, Australian Secondary School student survey of alcohol and drugs here in Australia. And you can see in, in, on this page, they've 
a any vaping in your lifetime? Have you ever in your lifetime? You can see very high rates of vaping um, amongst the oldest age groups up to 45% have ever used a vape. Um, but if you then look at lifetime use of cigarettes, of tobacco containing cigarettes, again, a steady decline has occurred across that time period. So um, amongst the, the youngest age group, there's a slight increase between 2018 and 2019, although that's not statistically significant. So once again, if we, if we were seeing an on-ramp to tobacco smoking, we would expect these graphs to be a bit more in alignment, but it seems like they're not. Um, lastly, if we have a look, and in Australia we haven't got as much data as overseas, we haven't been tracking this as long, and we also have the, the, the difficulty of, of having these liquids which are, um, you know, maybe nicotine containing or maybe not nicotine containing, but th this is a graph showing lifetime and current use of e-cigs from 2016 to 2019. Um, again, quite high uptake uh, amongst that younger age group there, so you're 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, we've got 64% say that they have ever tried, so to nearly two thirds, it's probably experimental. Um, the currently used figure being about 18%, so uh, that's, that's what we've seen on that one. But then, if we have a look then at the, at the daily smokers, like who is a daily regular smoker in Australia from the same study, you can see that the decline has continued in smoking, so we haven't seen the uptake occur. So this research is all starting to point to the fact that it doesn't really look like vaping is an on-ramp to tobacco smoking at this stage. So next question, could e-cigarettes be an off-ramp from tobacco smoking? Is this a pathway out and can people quit tobacco smoking with the use of vapes? Um, luckily for us, the Cochrane Review have done what they do best, which is an amazing meta-analysis. Uh, this was published in October last year and there are regular updates scheduled on this one. So they reviewed 50 studies and about a bit over half of them are randomised control trials, uh, over 12,000 participants all up and they, can, they compared e-cigarettes with the other standard quit smoking approaches like uh, NRT, um, I always struggle to pronounce that, veroniclean, um, nicotine free e-cigs, so flavoured liquids. Uh, regular counselling and advice to, and, and then no support. Uh, and so they followed all of those things and what they discovered in the plain English summary was that if 100 people try to stop smoking, e-cigs will work for about 10 people, NRT works for about 6 people and counselling or advice only works for about 4 people. So uh, this Cochrane Review has actually found e-cigs are more effective than NRT as a quit smoking aid, um, which is a very interesting finding. Um, I, I do suspect part of this is that I think there, there is a fair bit of underdosing of NRT out there. There is a fair bit of, um, of people not always using NRT uh, appropriately. And so I do sort of wonder about how that would change if we looked at exactly the NRT protocols that were being used. But I do think this tells us something very important that a lot of people are finding e-cigs are an effective way to quit tobacco smoking. Um, I think some of this is probably also related to the fact that the devices have improved over time and become better at delivering nicotine uh, compared to those first generation devices. And obviously if someone is nicotine dependent um, and they use a, an e-cigarette device that's very efficient and effective at delivering nicotine, then it will satiate the that, that cravings that they've got more so than those devices that are not as efficient at delivering nicotine. Popcorn lung. Now, this is something that is still being talked about because popcorn lung is a fascinating little disorder which is so called because it first uh, was seen in people who work in microwave popcorn factories and they would develop a particular lung condition uh, based on the exposure to the artificial butter flavouring which is used in microwave popcorn. So um, don't panic if you enjoy microwave popcorn. I'm sure regular uh, exposure to diacetyl in your household is fine. But the people working in the factory, when they're exposed to this chemical diacetyl, the butter flavoring agent develops some really severe lung problems. So this, um, in 2015, there was a study published which looked at a whole bunch of different samples of, of various e-liquids uh, from various countries around the world, and they found the majority of samples contain diacetyl, and that would be because of the butter flavouring. It's a flavouring agent, so that butter flavouring could be obviously mixed with various other flavours to create a nice smooth sort of taste. So this is where the popcorn lung research came from. Obviously very concerning. We know popcorn lung is a thing, and diacetyl uh, appears now in some of these flavoured liquids. However, there is an asterisk to this 
uh, the levels of diacetyl that they detected in these liquids were actually significantly lower than the levels found in regular cigarette smoke. Tobacco's, I think it's a, a reminder again of how toxic tobacco smoke actually is because tobacco smoke contains a lot of diacetyl, um, whereas the levels that they had detected in this was actually significantly lower. So at this time when it came out, it was, was a big scare for the manufacturers of these products. They removed diacetyl. Um, a bunch of them started to advertise the fact that they are diacetyl free because of the concern around popcorn lung at that time. And since then, we haven't gone on to see an epidemic of popcorn lung amongst people who are using e-cigs and vapes. It actually hasn't happened. So I think that this is an example of something that it was a concern. However, once we've really looked into it, uh, to, again, tobacco is more harmful than these liquids. Uh, and so the popcorn lung is probably not a really serious concern uh, for us at this stage. Now, the next um, other health issue I wanted to talk about, the so-called Ivali, the e-cigarette or vaping, vaping product use associated lung injury. This occurred in the United States initially in August, September 2019. And there was a, across the whole country, a really big increase in people who were presenting to EDs with breathing difficulties uh, after using e-cigs and vapes. Uh, this um, escalated significantly over several months uh, in the United States and also was seen a, to a lesser degree in Canada as well. Um, ultimately, by February 2020, I believe this number has gone up since then, there was uh, just under 3,000 cases and 68 confirmed deaths. So this was obviously massive concern. This was almost the concern everyone had been waiting for. Is like, is there going to be some product turn out to be really, really seriously dangerous and really injure people quite severely? And uh, it, this did occur in North America. Uh, uh, on investigating this, initially what, what became clear was that the majority of the people in these cases had been using cannabis containing e-liquids. Uh, not all of them, but the majority had been using cannabis containing e-liquids, which is a little unusual. Um, and ultimately, the current uh, belief around the most likely cause for this was vitamin E acetate, which was mixed in with the propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin solution in illegally produced THC containing liquids. Now, we have not seen Ivali occur anywhere outside of North America. And we also don't see cannabis containing e-liquids very widely available outside North America either. And I think that this, it's most likely that this vitamin E acetate was being added as a cutting agent just to extend the life of the product. It was never seen in any legally available cannabis products. Those are quite regulated in the US and are, are tested for safety and so forth. But there is still remains a big black market for these products in, in states where it is not legal. So ultimately, Ivali, as I mentioned, it has not occurred anywhere else in the world. And it does appear that the Ivali situation is very unique to the US and it's very unique to that particular cannabis, legal cannabis market that they have established that's left this sort of big black market in place as well uh, that led to the vitamin E acetate issue. So again, uh, sometimes Ivali is, is, is uh, put forward as if it, this is an issue with regular e-cigs available here in Australia. And that's actually not the case. This is a very, very particular issue to the, to the US and uh, to a lesser extent Canada. Um, this is a study, a really interesting study though, from uh, published in 2019. And this is looking at calls to poisons information line in Australia regarding nicotine uh, liquids. And you can see there's been obviously a big increase. 2013 is when this really started to take off, uh, that we st started to, people started to you know, have issues. And a lot of this was to do with children uh, who'd either been found with a vaping device, like sucking on the e-cig mouthpiece or uh, uncapped vials of liquids or drinking e-liquids, swallowing cartridges of e-liquids or splashing liquids in their eyes. And there has been at least one child has died in Australia following consumption of, a, of an e-liquid. So um, nicotine is really toxic, in, particularly in high doses. And there definitely is a risk to small children who consume it uh, accidentally. There are also risks associated with having liquids on your skin that can absorb through your skin and nicotine can absorb and then you can have a nicotine overdose, which can be quite uncomfortable. So this is definitely something to be concerned about, that, we, that people who are using these products need to um, store them very safely and be aware that these liquids can be quite dangerous when they're consumed. We have actually had uh, at least one call from uh, involving a, a, a person in Queensland who was um, consuming some of his e-liquid 
uh, orally during the day while at school because he was not able to vape at school. Uh, and the liquid he was using was Red Bull flavored, um, which sort of seemed to, I, my reading of that is that it indicated to him that it was orally consumable. Uh, he didn't experience any significant harms, but um, I think we should be quite clear to people that um, these are not designed to be taken orally and can make you very, very sick if you do. So there were um, uh, also, I should point out too, there were 12 calls which followed deliberate administration in the context of self-harm as well, uh, and including two calls relating to the injecting of e-liquids also. So again, this is just something to consider for services working with people who might be at risk of self-harm, uh, just to consider that there have actually been self-harm attempts in, in the context of consumption of these e-liquids as well. Um, now, this is a news article. This one was published in 2019. Uh, this occurred in Brisbane. This young fellow was out at a nightclub and he went outside with some friends and was offered a hit, a toke of a vaporizer from someone. And he collapsed and ended up very, very unwell and in hospital after having four draws on a vaporizer on a Friday night out and ended up in rural Brisbane hospital. Uh, his sister, I believe, in this article says that they think it was a mix of synthetic fantasy and ketamine. It's probably not the case there, but we do know that there have definitely been synthetic cannabinoids turn up in, in these liquids uh, and other types of novel psychoactive substances as well. So my guess is that this would be one of those novel psychoactive substances. It's possibly synthetic cannabinoid because they've been probably more common, uh, but there have also been some synthetic uh, novel benzodiazepines as well turned up in these liquids as well. So this is a relatively new thing that, that this has occurred. This hasn't occurred in a very wide sort of large scale, but um, it is something to consider that, you know, we are starting to see some psychoactive drugs uh, being administered in this sort of way. Um, and that's also occurred overseas too. So as you can see from all this, it's a very complicated topic because we've got so many different devices. Is it nicotine or is it not nicotine? Is it psychoactive or is it cannabis? Or, and this is one of the challenges that we've had in, in responding to the re request for support is how do we talk someone through this and explain it to people, particularly working in a school setting where schools are dealing with all these kinds of presentations and not really sure exactly how to respond. And um, then how is it that we're going to communicate this really complicated sort of set of information to our young people as well? Um, the other problem we've got is that, you know, it's possible that there are future harms coming from these products which we don't know about at the moment. And so how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the trade-off of the, the risk of a known future harm from tobacco? And we know tobacco is super toxic. Um, over time, we keep discovering more and more about how toxic it is. Um, versus the risk of a potential unknown future harm from vaping. And this does become a little bit challenging. Um, who is likely to receive a harm reduction benefit and who's not? So how should we respond to the young people who are vaping? Um, I think our approach to this is to go back to basics, is to respond to this issue the same way that we respond to all the other types of substance problems that we deal with all the time. Um, and that's to understand uh, the function of the substance for the person we're talking to. And, uh, you know, this is something really crucial here to understand, I think, is that what is the function of these products? And if you're, say you're in a school setting and you're working, you've got young people vaping at school, which is a common scenario, a common problem we keep, we're getting called about, is to understand, like, are these young people, are they nicotine dependent or not? Um, if they're nicotine dependent, then it, are, are they seeking to reduce harm via the e-cig? Is that what's going on? And if they're nicotine dependent, then our response to those young people obviously needs to focus around managing their nicotine dependence. And in those cases, we could look at things like NRT as a safer option, um, things like patches or lozenges and those kinds of things. But if it's if 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 they're only using flavoured liquids, they might, which we have to assume could also contain nicotine because we know that that's possible then what we're going to have to tr probably do is work out how to explain to young people that you might actually be consuming nicotine uh, even when you don't realise that you're doing that. We know that there is a very strong subculture, sometimes referred to as cloud chasers, which are just people who are trying to uh, blow smoke rings and do smoke tricks. And YouTube is full of vaping tricks. 
Uh, lots of people are making their own videos of doing all kinds of, you know, um, very elaborate smoke rings and various types of things. And if, if this is the, the major reason your, your young people are vaping, then how is it to best address that? Then I'd, I'd say that to me at a, in a school setting would look like it's just another sort of silly behaviour that we don't want happening in schools and not very different to some of the other sorts of trends that have gone through schools like the the chili challenge and all those sorts of other, other, other types of things. So we do have to try to understand the function. Uh, and again, if we've got people who are, who are using vape devices that contain cannabis to get the psychoactive effect, then again, that, that's a cannabis-like response. So we need to understand the function, the underlying drive behind why someone might be vaping. We want to understand the pros and cons from the young person's perspective, is just like we do with other drugs. You know, what do they enjoy about it? What are the less good things about it? And uh, you know, and and try to understand their own perception of of the risk and how it is. Then we could explain what those risks might be. Um, we also need to remember things not to do, same as the other drugs, like lecturing people, just telling them it's terrible and they should stop, uh, is not very effective. Scare tactics, not super effective as well. Trying to just scare people uh, does not work. We know people do just tune out on that. Um, also, fo obviously focusing on long-term risks as well. You know, harms that are quite, you know, very far in the future are also not, um, not a super useful kind of tactic to try and use. Instead, we've got to consider the drug person environment and that interaction of those three things and, and how, how do those three things come together. Um, every context is a bit different and every sort of uh, every school setting is different. The reasons these young people might be using vapes could be different. So we do have to be quite careful in how it is that we respond and make sure we're, we're nailing it down to the, the actual function for that young person. Now, we are right to be nervous about big tobacco companies. Um, they have a history of really unethical behaviour. And there is definitely a risk of big tobacco companies using these products to maintain the life of, of traditional tobacco. Uh, you can see here Marlboro, uh, which is one of the leading initiation brands that gets people into smoking. And how remarkably similar the dual device design is, and that's probably no mistake. Uh, so I think that it's definitely correct that we should be concerned about big tobacco uh, getting involved in this area. And I think that this, you know, some of this branding demonstrates what those concerns might look like. Um, Juul, as I mentioned as earlier, has got the salt form of nicotine, which is a really efficient way of delivering high doses of nicotine to people. So someone who's a cigarette smoker will, will uh, probably convert to a Juul fairly easily because of that. However, if you're not nicotine dependent and start using these sorts of devices, that really efficient nicotine delivery could induce dependence uh, a little bit more rapidly than those older style devices. So we should be nervous about big tobacco and we do need to definitely regulate uh, how these products are marketed and sold and where they're available and who gets access to them. Um, I'll, this is uh, some Juul advertising when Juul first came out. It's very funky. You can see it's maintained the triangular Marlboro shape there. Um, obviously very youth orientated. Um, Juul got into quite a bit of trouble over this recently in the US. Uh, where the US government started to look at regulating access to these products and even potentially banning these products because of concerns around this advertising targeting young people. So this is some of the original dual advertising material. It's obviously very youth focused. Um, but have a look at the more recent dual advertising. This is from their website recently. Designed for adult smokers. Uh, so they did a bit of a rebrand of their product to try to make it less obviously targeting young people who probably don't smoke and to shift their marketing to target adult smokers. And this is obviously a business decision that they've done in order to avoid being heavily regulated because that was definitely the pathway that that was going down. So there's um, some real lessons in, in this, I think. And Australia has done very well with our tobacco regulation and the way that we've managed to get some of the lowest rates of tobacco use uh, in the world and that has been because we have taken on some of the big tobacco companies through things like plain packaging and other types of, uh, of smoking measures and so we definitely do need to be very cautious about um, allowing uh, that to slip and allowing uh, big tobacco companies to get their teeth back into this market at, at a point at which we've had such low rates of smoking. So I think some of the concern is legit. Um, but there is a chance that for someone who is dependent on nicotine, that an e-cigarette is most likely safer. And that's pretty clearly true because tobacco smoke is just so toxic. And so this image here is trying to sort of start to get to, you know, who could reduce harm from it. And obviously it's a person who's nicotine dependent on, on tobacco smoke, 
might end up with less harm if they switch to a vape device. However, a person who's not nicotine dependent, if you've got a young person who's just cloud chasing, blowing smoke rings, then, well, there, there's no harm reduction benefit from that. They're inhaling vapor, which could potentially be toxic. We might find out down the track that there is some toxic uh, chemicals that are quite harmful. And so a person who's not nicotine dependent probably is increasing their risk of harm. So there, there, some people, it could be a harm reduction strategy, but for others, it, could, it might not be. So we need to be really careful that we don't just chuck it all in the one bucket and just say it's terrible for everyone because that's probably not true. Um, it's, is, it, it probably is not a great idea for some people, but for others, if they can't quit tobacco smoking, then it probably is a viable option for those people. So there's not a one size fits all approach, unfortunately. Um, in the UK, they've actually done a lot of uh, marketing directly trying to market e-cigarettes to people who smoke tobacco. Uh, they, Public Health England became fairly famous for this statement of 95% less harmful. And, you know, the, the, the really empirical basis of the 95% is a little questionable. We don't really know that for sure, although it's likely that there's definitely less risk. Um, but the, the UK approach has been to directly market to regular cigarette smokers uh, around this fact that e-cigarettes are not risk-free, but far less harmful than cigarettes. And New Zealand has gone down actually very similar sort of approach to this to try and um, target uh, these products only at the people where there could be a harm reduction benefit. At the same time, uh, we do need to try to restrict access to younger people where that is not the case and where this, you know, there, there, there could be a chance of the on-ramp to tobacco smoking. Um, even though it, it seems like that, that might not be the case, we should definitely be cautious. Uh, we've, we also just sat around the office and came up with a bit of a spectrum as well of these products. If, and this is just, this is not always set in stone. There's a whole bunch of different contextual factors to think about for individual people you might be working with when you're doing these sorts of scaling uh, exercises. But this is one that we sort of put together. If the, you think about the most risky forms of, of, of cannabis administration, the homemade bong, the orchi bottle there, uh, with the garden hose is probably quite toxic. Some of the smoke, some of the vapor that's being inhaled out of the um, the rubber and the plastic there, um, followed by the joint with no tobacco. You'll notice there's no tobacco in any of these at all. A uh, joint with no tobacco, glass pipe, um, oral cannabis uh, extract vaporizer with an asterisk next to it, just because extracts of TA of cannabis are very very potent, and in some cases could increase the harms of the psychoactive effects. So we we know that people can become more dependent uh, on these sorts of extracts, and so there's some caution around the recommendation of those, um, and probably the safest or the lowest risk of harm in a, a cat for cannabis would be the dry herb vaporizer. Um, if we look at a, a similar sort of harm reduction spectrum with these others, other, other products, if we have the tobacco cigarette, the combusted cigarette, as the most harmful, then it's likely the heated tobacco products are a little bit less harmful. It's likely the e-cigarettes are less harmful again. And then obviously nicotine replacement therapy, a good old patch or, or chewing gum or a, a lozenge would probably be the least risk of harm if we were thinking about nicotine along a similar kind of spectrum. So that's just something that we sort of made up in the office just to help try and put this, uh, put this down. Again, there are different contextual factors where that might not always be the case for the people that you're working with, but that's just one way we've put out there to start thinking about this. And just like other forms of harm reduction that we do with all other types of drugs, we're always creating these types of spectrums. You know, We want people who are injecting substances to switch to non-injecting routes of administration. We want people who use drugs like heroin uh, to switch to, to um, longer acting opioids like methadone or buprenorphine. It's actually exactly the same harm reduction philosophy that we use for those other drugs. The, the major difference we've got is the involvement of big tobacco companies in muddying the waters, and I think we should be cautious of that, but there are definitely things that we can do, and we have done in Australia, to restrict the impact of big tobacco in, in um, interfering with the public health response to this. So um, that's our presentation. So thank you all very much for tuning in. Um, we have got a copy of the presentation available for you to download. Um, and we have also recorded today's session, which we'll make available on YouTube afterwards. Um, we've also made a little fact sheet as well, which you can download. Uh, we've just produced a pretty basic two-page fact sheet, just covering a bit of a summary of some of this information, just help, mostly to help us handle the phone calls we're getting. Uh, and we're having the same conversation, which is quite complicated over and over again. So we've made a little fact sheet, which you're free to download and have a look at as well. Um, and there is also a, um, a little evaluation. If you're able to do that for us, that would be awesome. So thank you very much for tuning in.